Good afternoon, everyone. If, uh, if you wouldn't mind just taking a seat uh, so that we can get to Dr. Martin's presentation, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you. All right, well, uh, first, first half of the first day has gone pretty well, and we're excited to have Dr. Lorena Martin here with us to kick off the second half of the day. Uh, she'll be giving a presentation out of a new book that she's just published. Uh, the presentation is just on sports, sports performance measurement and analytics. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Martin for the 45-minute presentation. All right, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So welcome, everybody. I'm going to be talking to you today about sports performance measurement and analytics. And this is just a little outline of what I plan to go over, uh, some sports data science, oh, okay, and variables that affect performance, measurement, looking at the similarities and the differences between the NFL and the NBA combine, uh, an ATP pilot study looking at psychological measurements, and something that I like to call precision athleticism uh -huh, and uh, analytics. So what should you know? Well, many of us are different types of data scientists. I'm assuming there's a ton of different types of data scientists in the, in the audience right now, from the statistician to the mathematician to uh, the machine learning scientist. So we are all data scientists, but within this Venn diagram, we differ somewhat, slightly. And we all have some training in computer science, some more than others in math and statistics, and subject expertise, subject matter expertise. Can you all hear me okay, or is it too loud? This is, I feel, okay, great. Um, so as far as uh, subject matter expertise goes, that's what I will be focusing on today. Um, so subject matter expertise, in this case, we're talking about professional sports. What is your sport of interest? Uh, I always tell my students that they should have, you know, not all, they, they say, I love all sports. Okay, well, at least focus on the top three that you really can immerse yourself in. Can you go to a bar and talk to the actual sports fan and communicate with them about this sport at that level? Not only just know the numbers. Okay, so I'm going to delve a little bit into physiology. And just on the general surface, because I feel that it is something that all data scientists working in sports or in the sports science field should have some sort of familiarity with. And uh, so just bear with me. I will not go too in, in depth into physiology. So do not get scared. Okay. So here we have two athletes. And I always like to ask, well, I just gave it away, didn't I? Two athletes. So which is the real athlete is what I was going to say. And hopefully, I'm assuming that you all would have guessed the right answer, that they're both athletes, right? But they're very different by the sport that they partake in, by the type of training that they're involved in, right? And what makes them different? So there's <coughs> muscle fiber type distribution, so that's somewhat genetic, as well as the type of training. And some of the major characteristics of different muscle fiber types most of you have heard of, oh, are you type one or type two? Are you fast or slow twitch muscle, right? Uh, but typically, you don't, you're not aware that there are seven to eight different types of muscle fibers. In fact, some of them are hybrids, but for simplification purposes, we've categorized them into really two. And some that study it at, at a higher level, a more specific level, we do type one, type two A, type two X. But in reality, overall, they're known as type one and type two. Um, at the microscopic level, like I mentioned earlier, there's seven to eight different muscle fiber types um, of distribution. The thing that I want to focus on here, I guess I don't have, oh, I do have a pointer. Let me see here. Oh, no pointer. Okay, so if you could um, address your attention to fatigue resistance on the first column of the characteristic. If you look at fatigue resistance, and you actually look at type one, you see that they are high on fatigue resistance. What does this mean? This means that this individual can go for a longer length of time without getting tired. However, with that, they sacrifice power and force output, okay? <clears throat> so if you look at the type two fibers and um, force production and power output, you can see that they are low on fatigue resistance, meaning they're going to fatigue much quicker at a much quicker rate, but they're going to be able to produce explosive, powerful movements. Okay, so this is somewhat genetically predetermined, so, but this is not 
meant to say, now you can just exclude everybody that doesn't have type two fibers from being a track athlete. That's not what this is for. But this is meant to guide you as how they should be training. Now, one last one that I wanna bring your attention to is mitochondria size and density. And mitochondria size and density is very important. And I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But outside of the mitochondria in and of itself is a little engine in your cell that actually can generate ATP, which is energy, right? We even have the ATP tour called, for some reason, you know, ATP, right? Association for Tennis Professionals, but it's ATP. So the mitochondria is the one that actually can generate this ATP, but it utilizes oxygen. And here you have heard of, I'm sure you've all heard of aerobic exercise or aerobic training and anaerobic training, right? So here, this is where this really stems from. Okay, so keep that in mind. And I'm just gonna cover these three before we go into more of the measurement and analytics and how they all play a role. So there are three basic energy systems within our bodies, whether you're an athlete or not, whether you utilize them or not, right? So there's the phosphogen system, there's the glycogen system, and the oxidative phosphorylation system. Okay, now remember how I mentioned that the mitochondria needs oxygen in order to generate ATP. The phosphagen system does not require this. So whenever you have an athlete, uh, let's say a running back, and you know he's uh, doing the 40-yard dash, he's gonna be, most of the time, at least the first five to 10 seconds of his, well, hopefully he would do that under the, you know, time. but yeah, exactly. First five to, is the ATP PCR system is what we call it. So I say, wow, he has a heck of a ATP PCR system. That's how I like to look at it. But um, basically, they're, really utilizing it for only five to 10 seconds. Anything before five seconds, it's obvious that they're in that system. So anytime you start any type of training, you're utilizing that. Now, once you go beyond 10 seconds and you can say to yourself, well, I wanna sprint for two minutes. You may think you're sprinting and you're going all out for two minutes, but in reality, after the first five to 10 seconds, you have diminished your speed, your capacity for maximum power, and you're dipping into your fast glycolysis and slowly but surely going into oxidative system. Um, your oxidative system is typically more fat burning, so it also has to do with nutrition. And I mean, we could spend here hours talking about nutrition and these systems. So I just wanted to give you a brief overview because when you look at your numbers, you should think about the value, what is going on, and if how you can extrapolate what's going on with this particular athlete. Looking at, are they maybe maximizing the way they should be training? or is the way that they're training leading them to have injury, okay? These all play a role in this. Um, something else that I wanted you to look at is all the way to the right, the right column, the range of work to rest period ratios. So this is interesting in the sense that it was already thought about that you could train your body to utilize one of these systems more than us. So someone who has a type one, you all remember, right, type one? Which one that is? Okay, good. So that one, uh, type one, slow, muscular, uh, that has a lot of muscular endurance capacity and cardiorespiratory endurance capacity. And they would be possibly on the oxidative, and you wanna train them to have more type two fiber characteristics. You would have them go ahead and do the one to three, one to 12, one to 20 ratio, rather than the one to three ratio. So these are things to keep in mind. Obviously it's a little bit more complex than just a brief overview, but these are things for you to consider. And I'm definitely not gonna go into detail about this, but just wanted to let you know what goes on in the athlete's body based on the type of training that they do. There's stimulation and inhibition of different types of gene expression as well as <clears throat> hormones, okay? And this is one of the main reasons that you see a lot of athletes using performance enhancing drugs, right? Um, because it activates certain issues. As a matter of fact, recently with the whole Sharapova event, okay? chronic heart failure, I'm not gonna get into that, but the medication that she's using actually allows for increased cellular uh, respiration. So she's maximizing her oxidative capacity. I'm not saying that anything about that though. So um, going on to muscle fiber types and sports, if you look here, uh, you have different phenotypes, different types of athletes. It does not mean that if you are you know, not tall enough or, not, or you're not built enough, you're not an athlete. Everybody has a different body type based on their genotype, right? Their phenotype being their expressed body. And basically, some may be more predisposed to performing better in some sports than others, okay? So 
With this, keeping this thought in mind, if you translate it over to sports, you realize that between different sports, you should treat them differently, how they get assessed as well as how they train. And with that, not only within the sp between sports, but within the sport in different player positions, which is what I'm gonna get into now. So we're, I'm just gonna take a, a, a quick second just to look at uh, the differences and the similarities between the NBA draft combine and the NFL combine. And uh, some of this is, is taken from my book. Um, and so if we just look here, some similarities that they both have is that they both assess uh, athletes in the vertical jump, although the NBA calls it the max vertical leap, and they also have the standing uh, leap, right? So in the NFL, if you look at this, now, of course, this is not the best uh, athlete, I would say the best player position to have the highest vertical jump, but out of the positions lifted, listed there, you can see that the quarterback is doing quite well, is reaching quite high compared to maybe a defensive tackle, right, or a center. So these are just some differences done with a simple ANOVA and some R code that you can just examine with the publicly available data. Um, here you have the 40 yard dash, and uh, here you see that the quarterback again performs better typically. I mean, there are exceptions, there's a lot of variability as you can see, but the quarterback performs better with the center performing the worst and defensive ends not too great. Um, of course, we're not including the running back in here or the wide receiver, I mean, but these are just between these player positions. As for the broad jump, this is another test. We utilize that in physiology to assess anaerobic power. <clears throat> now, it's not utilized, this test, it's interesting because it's not utilized in the NBA combine, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so if you look at the broad jump and distance reach, you can see that the quarterback actually has more distance that they reach um, and in comparison to the defensive tackle or uh, the offensive guard. Just some similarities and some differences. So one of the questions I pose to you is, should they all be tested on this? And uh, are some of these measures irrelevant to some of these player positions? And could they be um, optimized? Could certain measures be optimized? Right? And I know that the NFL Combine is working on that. Uh, so here on the 20-yard shuttle, the 20-yard shuttle, also known as the Pro Agility Drill or the 5105 Agility Drill, uh, basically what they're trying to assess is change of direction. This, it's really how quickly can they change direction, right? So agility. And you see that the quarterback, again, performs better because the y-axis is looking at time, right? So at the four, you know, they have a less time that they take to complete this uh, assessment versus, let's say, an offensive guard, okay? And this is my favorite, the bench press, uh, because there's a lot of, in my, in my opinion, there's a lot that could be modified here. The bench press is performed at 225 pounds in the NFL combine, and what, is, what their purpose is to assess muscular strength which uh, typically is a maximum amount of force that one could generate in one repetition, and muscular endurance, which is the maximum number of repetitions that you could perform, right? And so that's what they're trying to get at here, and as you can see, the center performs extremely well, having some between 35 and 40 reps at 225 pounds, versus the quarterback, very you know, poor in comparison. So maybe you wouldn't even want to assess your quarterback in this. Maybe they would be more prone to injury. I'm not going to say that that's the case. I'm just throwing out some questions to you, okay? Um, if you want to know more details about differences among player positions in the NFL, uh, these are some pages from my book. And then the ANOVA, I just ran a simple ANOVA, assuming normality there. And then looking at the two key post talks, um, you could see some differences in the P adjusted values on different assessments. But moving on to the NBA, NBA draft, if you look at the max vertical leap, which is um, the same basically as the, the vertical jump, you can see that for instance, the shooting guard and the point guard are up there and the uh, centers and power forwards are, have a tendency to um, not jump as high. And it's kind of interesting because they're some of the tallest, right? Some of the tallest don't jump as high as some of, the, uh, some of the shortest, right? So that's kind of an interesting relationship right there. But they are comparable to the NFL's 
max vertical leap because some of them were reaching those numbers. If you look at the lane agility drill, which is interesting to see because they don't um, necessarily use the same agility drills as the NFL, but uh, you can see here that uh, one of the ones that uh, performs not the best, I would say, is the power forward, but some of the best, again, the shooting guard and the, and the point guard, uh, definitely they need to have good um, values of agility. And if not, then we could look at something else, but I'll get to that in a little bit. So this is where I want you to bring your attention to, is the bench press. Is, it's really interesting in the sense that they're established at 185 pounds, right? And uh, what you see here is that they perform a lot lower repetition, number of repetitions in comparison to the NFL. So if I just take you back for the to the NFL, oh, right there, you can see that they're performing 35 up to 40. And uh, you come back down here, they're going up to 5, 10, or 15 repetitions maximum at 185. So at a lot lower load. And what we consider load, when I say load, I'm not talking about the wearable technology load. I'm talking about resistance weight that you're carrying. So here you can see that there are major differences. And you know it's interesting to see because Kevin Durant, you, you say, oh, well, can you predict performance based on the bench press? Well, obviously, it may not transfer to some player positions is what I want to get at because Kevin Durant, for instance, couldn't perform one repetition at 185. So goodness sake, if you were to say, I predict his performance by that, you would have ridden him off, right? So that's something that you don't want to look at. And more recently, this came out in the article uh, by ESPN's magazine. And we always thought, you know, height is very important. Height is a great predictor of performance. And I'm not writing it off. I'm not saying that it does not contribute to performance. But what I am saying is that there are better predictors of performance rather than height, such as wingspan. And although maybe to be a presidential candidate, you don't necessarily need good hand size. But um, in basketball, it has been shown that hand size is important and is a better predictor of performance uh, for basketball as well as football, but not for presidential candidacy, okay? Okay, with that, um, I developed, along with one of my, with my colleague, um, Dr. Miller, and we developed a measurement model for sports. Obviously, uh, there's the equation portion of it, but this, these are variables that definitely would contribute to performance and have been shown by the literature to contribute to performance. All the physical variables include the major five uh, that were known before, which included muscular strength, muscular power, muscular endurance, and flexibility, um, added to some of the other ones that were based before, including reaction time, coordination, body composition. What, I, what we added there was sport-specific skills, something that I teach my students at Northwestern is one of the important things that is really discounted a lot of times is the technicality. I see this being assessed much more in soccer than some other sports. Um, I do see now um, in the combine and the NBA draft that they have you know, certain specific position skills. But I think that is very important. Uh, as for physiological variables, lactate threshold, right, which is a good determinant of how much you can push the athlete before they start to reduce capacity, not because they want to, because their body cannot do it anymore, right? There's a high amount of lactate buildup, lactic buildup. And you have resting heart rate, you have blood pressure, VO2 max. I'm not going to go through all of them in particular, but for instance, for instance, glucose and insulin, in the sense they're not going to, most of them, because there are some that, are, that have diabetes, but basically what you're looking at is insulin sensitivity. Do they have previous injuries? Telomere length, methylome, that is something that I've been working on for quite a while with the telomere length. There are good indicators of biological aging, so that's just something to keep in mind. That is something new that I've picked up at the SALT. Um, the psychological variables, there's many of them. Uh, behavioral variables, nutrition, things that they do. Behavioral variables, think about them as things that they do, as they eat this or they sleep how many hours, right? And environmental variables, including socioeconomic status, do play a role, in particular, maybe when you compare tennis and golf to basketball and football. So psychological variables have often been neglected. Um, they should be measured and quantified in professional athletes. I do believe this. A lot of my students, after they're taking the course, they say, oh my goodness, there's such a gap that you could all fill. Um, basically, there are these factors, and I list these in my book. These are the factors that have been shown to contribute to performance in some way or form or shape or manner. And 
are not typically assessed. And I also give you the name of the scale that could be used. Now, there's a problem with this. The problem with this is that they're all self-reported measures. Okay, so that's something that is always going to be subject to, to bias. Here's another list. Other factors, the 16 PF is a good one. Yeah, a lot of anxiety and confidence assessments going on here and team cohesion. Now, I'm gonna take you to the ATP pilot study that I had. I'm gonna have to go a little quicker because I'm running out of time. But um, so something that I was curious about was narcissism and performance and do they, does it predict greatness? So uh, does being narcissistic predict greatness or does greatness lead to becoming narcissistic? I don't know, but Muhammad Ali was saying that he was the greatest. I said that even before I knew I was. And then he goes on to say, I'm not only the greatest, I'm double the greatest. I can even pick the round, right? So I thought that was very humorous, and I was like, hmm. And LeBron, for instance, I love LeBron, but here he's, he speaks in third person, so the Lorena still likes LeBron, right? So, <laughs> uh, so I conducted a small pilot study on narcissism and performance in the top uh, t male professional tennis players at a Delray Beach tennis tournament a few years back, and what I did is I'm going to show you a similar assessment. I'm not going to show you the assessment that I gave them, that I developed, but this is a similar assessment that actually was developed in Harvard. It's called the Implicit Association Task because I wanted to get at something that is more objective rather than subjective, right? And so here, if you have sports data analysts, so if you could all bring your attention here and just look, sports data analyst to the top right, cooking chef to the left. When you see this, it's a categorization task. You're supposed to send this picture to whichever column, to whichever category you think it fits, right? So supposedly, this is a picture of sports data analysts. So they belong here, right? Cooking chef belongs there, okay? Others, then what the trick is that then when you have double categories, what you have to do is you have to categorize it. Others would belong under the category not me, whereas me or myself would go under me. The problem is that by this time, you pretty much associate that me belongs under sports data analyst, and it's kind of tricking you. So what you're looking at is you're looking at the reaction time and the latency period, and that's how you determine if the athlete or if you really believe that you're a sports data analyst or not. In that, in that sense, I would have um, put narcissist or confident, and I would have associated it. Because many athletes will say, yes, of course I'm confident. But many of them truly are not as confident as some of, them, as some of the others. <clears throat> so that's just uh, another little th um, a study that's uh, published in my book. It was just looking at uh, earnings by country in tennis. There's a big discrepancy. But what's interesting about it is that some of the countries that have the largest populations um, don't bring up as many tennis players, professional tennis players. I did this using ArcGIS as well as R. And um, something else that I developed was adding to this, to adding to the statistics in the sport of tennis. Um, basically, it's very simplified in tennis and there's not a lot. So I felt uh, we needed to add a little bit to that and using uh, abbreviations. Now, do these measures translate over to on-court and on-field performance? <clears throat> so can anybody tell me who this is? Okay, well, all of you over here, yes, in the Northeast, well, no. All right, so that is Tom Brady. Uh, should outliers that um, be what we're looking for rather than think about them as a disturbance and just remove them, right? And so here, you know, who would have ever expected that he would have won so many Super Bowl champions, four out of six, right? So, and also here, which kid would you bet on being the best athletic specimen? Which one do you think would be the best athletic specimen? A lot of people would say all the one to the far left, uh, the, the one all the way to the far left, right? Well, that's Lionel Messi right there, that little scrappy fella, yeah, who barely fits in his shirt. And nobody would have ever predicted that, right? So something to keep in mind is that you have genetics and you have the training lifestyle. If you have poor genetics, poor training, you're going to be, a, you know, maybe not a good athlete, right? Uh, genetics, I was going to say something maybe about what division, but then I was like, mm, let me not say. So if you have poor genetics and better training and lifestyle, it could be a good athlete. You're compensating for your genetics. If you have good genetics but poor training, poor lifestyle, you're out drinking and using drugs and all this, maybe you're still a good athlete because you're so talented. But what we want is both, right? Uh, what we want to see is both and what we want to predict is that. So. <clears throat> At the Salk Institute, I know it sounds crazy or not, but they're trying to regenerate <laughs> many different parts of the body and as well as they perform gene editing. And gene editing is quite interesting because there's this concept that, oh, well, it, they're using it not for it to create Olympic athletes. That's not what I do in my spare time. But uh, what they do there with gene editing is trying to um, obviously remove 
the predisposition to having a disease, right? So in here, what, there, what we would do is try and maximize the type two fibers that you want per sport and so forth. So you wanna create the Olympic baby. Um, something that we can take from the, me the medical world is that they have what is called precision medicine. And if you take a look at this, you have patient groups, and if you look at this cohort in the center as your group of athletes in your NBA team and so forth, uh, you have, yes, you have drugs that are toxic but beneficial, drugs that are not toxic and not beneficial, drugs not toxic and beneficial, and drugs that are toxic but not beneficial. So at the end of the day, once you do all of these assessments and you're predicting, you're basically gonna grab maybe one out of the four groups that it's actually that they're gonna respond to it. And actually, if you look at the pharmacological data, it's actually much poorer than that. All these medications, if you're taking any of them, just by the way, just randomly, but um, in precision medicine, they give this cookie cutter kind of assessment to everybody. They, they give you this diagnosis and they prescribe to you. And you do not necessarily respond. The blue is the only person that really responds well to this. And the red are all the people that it's either having a toxic effect on or having no effect on, which I find fascinating that we're not aware of this. Um, so obviously with uh, genetics and investments and uh, advances in science and technology, uh, we're now you know, looking at cartilage. That's cartilage, that's not a toe, by the way. <laughs> that's not a toenail, that's a cartilage. Um, cartilage regeneration, so we could prolong career of athletes, as well as you can see that many athletes are doing, there's LeBron, um, cryotherapy, uh, well, yeah, cryotherapy. Um, as a matter of fact, you know what's interesting is that they do this to stem cells. Right, and to other types of cells. And what you do is you freeze them so that you can use them at a later time. And, uh, but the theory behind it for athletes is that it actually uh, reduces inflammation because it shuts down your immune system for a few seconds. Right? And a lot of stars are using it, but for different purposes. It's not like they're gonna go run the 40 yard or try and improve recovery. They're just trying to look good for their purposes. Right? So um, along with wearables and all this ability to quantify this data, I advocate for this precision athlete or precision athleticism, which is what I think of. Um, so right now, there was a call from the President Obama's precision, well, this was last year, actually, President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative. And so what they're trying to do is they say, you know, you cannot have this uh, cookie cutter assessments for everybody or for every everybody in this sport or everybody in this position. It should be much more individualized if you really want to improve that individual. And what they call it is the N of one person trials. And so I advocate for that using with wearable technology. And so the interpretation of your data is a work of art. And this is Salvador Dali. And you'll see why I put that in there. So just looking at time varying covariates and uh, different types of data, right? Different ways of looking at your data. These are simple methods from the medical world that you can also apply. Okay, and so digitized analytical work of art. You can end up with something that's wonderful with all the data that you get uh, taking into account. And so with that, if any of you like to you know, have any, any more questions about it or any more performance, you can look at that online and you can have a code to get 35% off. Um, the top book is mine, the bottom book is my colleagues. Um, that's more for sports management, the bottom one, the top one is for sports performance. And so in sum, we have covered multiple factors that affect performance, objective measurements, the precision athleticism, utilizing analytics, and uh, I want to thank I want to thank Northwestern, uh, Catapult, and then the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference for having me over. So, any questions? <laughs> yeah, go back a slide. All right. Oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good. Well, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay, I would definitely, I mean, I'm just gonna give it out there to you, but I would definitely use it in the form of preventing injuries or seeing what they may be predisposed to. I would also use it in the form of seeing where their baseline is and seeing how they're responding to different types of training. That's how I would uh, probably use, utilize that. Any other questions? To what extent can they be modified? 
Well, that's a great question. Um, so he asked, uh, to what extent do you think that psychological variables can be trained or modified? I definitely do see that they can be trained and modified. I, I did about seven years of training and two years were in practicum dealing and consulting with uh, clients and, uh, or patients at that time. And, but even if you look at LeBron when he first came into the Miami Heat, it was a much, he had a much different demeanor and perspective in the way that he spoke and, and you know, was with his teammates. And then by the time that he got out of that, which I think Dwayne Wade did a good job of mentoring, that's just my opinion. And I'm not saying that he goes to a therapist or anything, but I just, I have seen him mature and I see this with a lot of athletes. So I definitely think that there is room for improvement. I think they have to want to acknowledge and they have to want to immerse themselves in change. But some of those things are more difficult to change than others. That's the other point. Yes. self-reports. Yeah, so I definitely think that with big data, I mean, it's not going to make it more complex. I think it's actually going to be able to um, elucidate patterns. And you can see that there, are, there is a fine line. It's funny because you did mention self-efficacy. What, what distinguishes self-efficacy from narcissism and what di distinguishes self-efficacy from confidence? And they're very different and they have different lines. And I'm sure that that will become clearer as you have more data to examine but also developing better models. And I actually put that out to you as a call for action to develop maybe po better objective models um, that you could use to assess athletes. I hope that, I, that can answer your question. Any other questions? How much time do we have? That's it, oh, okay. So with that, um, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed it.